Birmingham, Alabama Office of Blueprint Construction Council. I'm the chair of the ABA Forum on Construction Law. And on behalf of the forum, I'd like to welcome you to another installment of the forum's monthly diversity and inclusion brunch series, featuring Doretta Rhodes, who's a senior vice president of People Capital for the Atlanta Braves, and Tom Garrett, chief human resources officer for Brassfield and Gorey. The ABA Forum on Construction Law is the largest organization of construction lawyers in the world and serves as a thought leader and resource to the construction industry. A diversity and inclusion is a priority to the forum, and we consistently take action to enhance participation, inclusion, and leadership opportunities for attorneys of diverse backgrounds in forum programs, publications, and other initiatives. The forum offers several scholarships, fellowships, and leadership development programs to enhance diversity among construction lawyers. If you're not yet a member of the forum or an affiliate, I invite you to join our organization and participate more fully in our ongoing programs to support the construction industry. You can do so by going to AmericanBar.org and searching under the Construction Law tab. Now, on a broader scale, the forum is committed to raising awareness and understanding of the vital role that diversity plays in the construction industry. For many years, the forum has featured a broad spectrum of prominent keynote diversity speakers at each of its national meetings, ranging from civil rights uh, lawyer Fred Gray to the Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin, the first woman to serve as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, and Vicki O'Leary, an iron worker and 2019 ENR Award of Excellence winner for her efforts to combat harassment on construction project sites. Recently, the forum held its first ever national meeting dedicated exclusively to inclusion, diversity, and professionalism within the construction industry. Now, at the core of the forum are principles of respect, professionalism, inclusion, and collegiality. Now, in addition to race, gender, ethnicity, and other categories traditionally associated with diversity and inclusion, we also value the diversity of ideas, perspectives, and opinions. Accordingly, through the Diversity and Inclusion Brunch series, we feature a one-hour conversation with keynote speakers who provide insight into issues of diversity, inclusion, construction, and the legal industry. The brunches are held at 1 p.m. Eastern on the third Thursday of each month. These programs are free, and are open to all members of the forum, friends, clients, and anyone else who's interested. Pre-registration is required. And I'll ask you to mark your calendar for our next session uh, on the third Thursday of next month and stay tuned for announcement about registration and other details. We'd like to thank Nick Holmes, chair of the forum's diversity and inclusion committee for his support in the development of this series. And we'd like to thank Tamara Harrington, LaShonda Williams, Colleen Hardison, and all of our forum staff for helping to make this program a reality. Now with that, we'll get into our session, and I'm pleased to introduce the person principally responsible for organizing today's session, our moderator, Jody Taylor, who's in-house with Brassfield and Gorey. Now Jody also serves as the chair of our Labor and Employment Division within the forum, all affectionately known as Division Six. And so if you are not a member of that division, labor and employment affects all of us in whatever capacities that we are uh, dealing with within the industry. So I'd encourage you to check out their division page on the forum website. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jody. Thank you, Arlen. Good afternoon, everyone. We are so excited that you're here to join us for this very um, important um, conversation. And I am very privileged and excited to introduce you to our two speakers. Um, first, I'll introduce you to Doretta Rhodes. Doretta joined the Atlanta Braves in 2019 as Senior Vice President of Human Resources, overseeing people capital initiatives for the organization's Major League, Minor League, and the Battery Atlanta operations. Prior to joining the Braves, Dr. Rhodes was the Executive Vice President, Chief Human Resources Officer of the YMCA of Metro Atlanta, Vice President of Human Resources at First Data, Vice President of Human Resources for Turner Broadcasting and held leadership positions at Ernst & Young, ADP, Homegrocer.com, and Young Brand. Dr. Rhodes received her undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia, her Master's in Business Administration from Clark Atlanta University, and her PhD in Adult Education from the University of Georgia. 
She is a certified facilitator for the Benchmark 360 assessment by the Center for Creative Leadership, DISC coach and facilitator, qualified facilitator for the Myers-Briggs type indicator, and Hogan assessment and Hogan 360. Doretta lives in Atlanta with Georgia with her husband and three sons. Next, I'm excited to introduce you to Tom Garrett. Tom Garrett has served as corporate vice president for Bradsfield and Gorey, one of the nation's largest privately held general contractors since 1999 and added the role of chief human resources officer in 2013. He is responsible for the overall leadership, strategic direction and planning for the human resources, field training, personal development and career development departments for Bradsfield and Gorey. Those departments support all of Bradsville and Gorey's operating divisions and approximately 3,000 employees located across 12 corporate offices. Prior to becoming Chief Human Resources Officer, Tom served in the role of Chief Safety Officer for six years, also at Bradsville and Gorey. Tom has his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from University of Alabama at Birmingham and a Master of Science degree in Construction Management Civil Engineering from Auburn University. Tom and his wife live in Birmingham and have four children, three of whom are triplets. So um, <laughs> I'm sure that could be its own conversation. Um, both of our panelists serve in a variety of civic and professional boards and organizations and are very active in their communities and human resources organizations. So they've got a lot of experience and knowledge to share with us and, and I'm excited to go ahead and, and get into the conversation. So as, as a starter, we've, we've gone through, you know, the, the high level resume type background um, information, but I'm, I'm curious, Doretta, if we can start with you is what's your, um, discuss your background that we didn't already hit and, and in particular, what led you to human resources and, and, and people management, organization management? So I will tell you, interestingly enough, I did not start out in human resources. I actually thought that I was going to end up running hotels. Hence the reason I have an undergraduate degree in hotel restaurant, restaurant management. But, in, but as we go along this path, I had um, the opportunity to go into HR very early in recruiting. And then from there with Yum Brand, which at the time was PepsiCo. And then from there, I went to an organization, small little organization called ADP that was specifically around um, services, HR services. And it gave me a very different perspective around how human resources looks and is viewed in organizations from a very functional way that organizations determine payroll. But in that role, what happened is I met a CEO who talked to me about diversity and inclusion. And, is, and specifically, what he wanted to do was really increase the numbers of both women and people of color that were coming in and recruiting for roles within a function, within a, a portion of ADP. And so, and I say his name all the time because I will tell you, he was a mentor to me around what this topic even was and why he even wanted to do it. He was a former McKinsey guy who um, came to ADP and we started actually doing grassroots efforts. And I say grassroots because it really was specific in that particular division where we started focusing on recruiting and diversity recruiting. And that kind of gave my segue into even being focused on what diversity and inclusion looks like. And so from there, in that particular role, I went into a position with Ernst & Young. And at the time, Ernst & Young had put in this brand new role of inclusiveness leaders across the country. And that role was to focus on getting women and people of color to partnership. And so when I did that, again, it was a great opportunity for me to see and understand the implications a diversity and inclusion in a business and in a partnership. And so it's, it's interesting, my, my journey of both human resources and diversity and inclusion has been in parallel with everything that I've done. So I've had the opportunity to either lead diversity and inclusion or have it as a part of the function of what I'm doing, but always having, I guess you would say, an influence and a hand in what diversity and inclusion looks like. And since I started that many years ago to today, it has evolved into various different things. But I think the most important conversation that we need to have because of the fact that it partners very well from a people capital and HR perspective is probably why I ended up doing it anyway. And I would tell you, I was kicking and screaming. I was like, I do not want to do diversity. I do not want to be the poster child of diversity for various different reasons of what I thought, the reason why. 
But when I was able to actually do the work of diversity and inclusion and influence leaders around the importance of making sure that you are providing an environment where everyone can come and they can bring their whole selves. And we'll talk about that because that's not necessarily an easy thing to do, I think. It really has helped me have a very perspective lens, both on my, with my HR people capital side, with the, with the ideal of, of diversity and inclusion in that. And so again, I had not even thought that I would be a diversity and inclusion HR person 20 plus years ago. So it, it, it's one of those things that I've been very blessed to now do and, and help organizations look at a very different lens from that perspective. Thank you, that's so interesting. Um, yeah, I think there, there's definitely a lot we're gonna get to later to kind of unpack within that, but that's, that's very, um, very, very good background, good story. Um, Tom, same question to you. Um, you know, you are an electrical engineer <laughs> and, and then um, moved to construction management. So what, what, what besides that, that, you know, and I mentioned your background, what sure. did it and then what, what led you into human resources? Sure, thank you. Um, and let me just thank Arlen and you, Jody, for inviting me to be here. Dorette, it's an honor to be here with you. I think we should all say go Braves. Yes. Make everyone in the audience is not a Braves fan, but you know, yes. we at least on camera, we can say go Braves. And yes. we're very proud at Brass Fenigori and full disclosure, Jody and I work together. You probably picked up on that, but we're very proud to have been one of the contractors that got to build Truist Park where we think mm -hmm. that's the finest ballpark in America. And um, that's, a, that's something we all have in common here. So it is a pleasure to be here. My uh, HR and DNI background is, I guess, in some ways similar. I started out as an engineer, Jody, as you mentioned, and worked on our operations. Um, I've been at Brassford and Gory for 36 years and worked in operations um, for most of that time, 20-ish years or so. Um, but then as you, in around 2000, 99 or so, my role shifted into a more corporate role. And as an engineer, and I'm a learner, I love learning and um, got involved with corporate areas that needed two things primarily. One is to bring them into alignment with our business initiatives um, and have a person who could maybe bridge um, the operations needs with the technical parts of the, of the department that that don't necessarily totally align with operations. And so to bridge that, I was doing that. And then in engineering fashion to bring in best practices, what are best practices? Let's, let's start using them. And um, I started in that role in IT and then kind of moved over to safety as you met, as you said, and then HR was is this, this current role. And so either I'm kind of moving along to help the company grow in some areas and bring alignment in some areas, or, and this has also been said, the company believes I have potential, but they can't quite place it. And so let's try this and see if that takes. And I don't know, just, um, but I've been able to be here. And I do enjoy um, working with teams. And, and I'm a believer in this idea that once you see something, you can't unsee it. So the, it's very important to see reality. If you, um, if you wanna aim for world-class, and I can't necessarily argue that we are world-class, but if we're gonna to grow towards world-class, you've gotta know what that is. Um, and then your target's right. And once you see something that's not right, you can't unsee it. And in the world of construction, as I imagine most in this audience knows, it's a white male dominated industry that has been for years. Um, and I, once you see that that doesn't really represent society, how is it so? How is it that it's this way in our industry and it should be different? It should be changed. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. So diversity inclusion is the pathway to making the construction industry, at least in our company, more in alignment with society and how things should be. That's great. Um, thank you, Tom. And that's also a great segue. I'm going to throw a question to Doretta. You, you, you hit on this. You, you had the opportunity to be involved with one of the early adopters in the DNI space, um, and so I wondered if you'd mind sharing your experience through that opportunity. You know, I, I, I was really um, impressed, and I guess uh, unfortunately surprised at how early <laughs> um, that it started. And so um, I think I think that'd be something that'd be really helpful um, to, to share with this group. I would, and and I will tell you, it it also gave me a really 
it gave me a very intentional foray around diversity and inclusion. So back in 2005, 2006, I left ADP in an HR capacity and went to work for Ernst & Young, EY, in a role that they called an inclusiveness leader. Now, mind you, in 2005 and 2006, we were not speaking about diversity from an inclusiveness standpoint. We were still just calling it diversity. And so it's interesting. I went into this role and the focus, and it, there were one of us across the country and I supported the Southeast and the Caribbean, and across the country, we were focused on getting women and people of color to partnership. And so what that meant is that we had to think programmatically around what that looked like. We had to think about diversity metrics because there is a, my perspective, a distinct difference between diversity because diversity speaks to metrics and what, you know, I say the body bag that people sit in and inclusiveness speaks to individuals feeling like they belong. One of the things that Ernst Young was facing at that time is that you would have individuals that would get to manager and you would have at that point, our senior manager, and at that point, individuals were opting out to further their career as a partner within the organization. And the feedback that we were receiving is that there was lack of flexibility for women in terms of if they wanted to start a family and what, and what that looked like. And, the difficulties they knew that that would be if they were a partner. And the other side of it was, I don't feel included. I don't feel like I'm part and I want to have that. And the other outcry that EY experienced is that their clients were talking to them at that point in time. And so we were in this role and we worked with partners and we put in programs and we had conferences and we got information. And I would say to you, what, what is even more compelling is that work that started in 2005, you can see a difference in terms of women and people of color partnership today in EY. And so it goes back to the intentionality. They were very intentional around that. And that was not something that was necessarily the buzzword or that was, you know, that was popular at the time. It really was driven by business initiatives and impact and the reason that they felt that it was critical and that all of these other things came in play, not only for, for women, of, um, for people of color or women, but it was your LGBTQ community. It was all these different things that, that we were doing that was just leading edge. And what that provided for me was an opportunity to know that that platform is much more far reaching and so I was able to have that lens in every role that I went to from that, from that standpoint. And I still look at the work that we did, like the BRGs, the business resource groups, the employee resource groups were so impactful. But again, that was something that we started in 2005. And something very similar, I would say to you that I saw Frito-Lay do a division of Pepsi very early on too, in terms of driving um, revenue in different parts of the country and wanting to bring their employees together to talk to them about that. So just some really, you know, very leading edge things that were happening very early on. And that's more than, you know, that's, that's been quite some time ago. And just think about where we are today. It's true. And as you were speaking, it made me think too, you know, number one, intentional, intentionality. And I see we had a, a chat where someone agreed intentionality is the key. Um, but also, you know, I think when we, most organizations I feel like that are addressing DNI are talking about intentionality. And then you, you mentioned that it, it was successful, but what was the look back period? Like, how do we, you know, it seems like much like, you know, kind of where we are with COVID, this is a marathon. <laughs> maybe I recently heard it's an Iron Man, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, how would you advise organizations and, and just when you're, when you're making these plans, what's your litmus? Where do you look back to then determine success or to keep going? Or do we need to pivot and change our plan? Because maybe it isn't working, but maybe we haven't given enough time. What yeah, I think that's a great question. I think the one thing that we have to do is give ourselves grace. So, it, and it is not, it is not a sprint. It is not, you know, how quickly can I run to that finish line? There is no finish line. It truly is a marathon. It truly is and evolution. So the first thing I would say when you start talking about look back, that you give yourself grace, because I think a lot of times the conversation is, oh, we should have done X, Y, Z. Well, that's not, 
you know, I don't want to do revisionist history, nor do I want to have us make up what the history was. The, the, the ideal is, I'm sure there were components that you were looking at, and now, what do you consider that's intentional that you need to do? I've been in two organizations where I've had the opportunity to launch diversity and inclusion councils. In both of those organizations, they were launched for very different reasons. One was launched as a result of what are the things that we need to do that is client facing so that we can feed that back to our organization and understand how we then can engage our staff with that. The other one was very internally based because it was around engagement of staff. So I think the first thing any organization or any leader needs to do is think about what are you trying to solve for and what are you trying to do to engage people to want to be a part of your organization. So you start looking at metrics and understand what are your recruiting numbers? What does that look like? Where are you recruiting from? Are you having a diverse slate? How are you promoting individuals throughout the organization? How are you setting up um, training for people to be able to be developed? And are you setting it up in such a way, whether you're global, whether you're national or regional, are you setting it up in such a way that everyone would have an opportunity from an equitable standpoint to go through that. And so it really is, you know, it, it scares me for people to say, oh, I haven't done the right thing. I don't necessarily know that's the case. What I would say is that I would look at where you are today, what are the things that you have done before, and where are you trying to get to? What are you solving for? And what do you want to have in your organization where people want to thrive? regardless, again, of that body bag that they sit in. I love it. That's great. Um, I bet our engineer would, would like that process based. <laughs> sure. um, Tom, same question to you um, a bit, you know, what, what is, what's been your experience with diversity and inclusion? What has Bradsfeld and Gory been doing? And, you know, what, what are we doing now? Sure. Thank you. Um, I love what you just went through, Doretta. And, for establishing maybe some credibility with the audience. I'm very proud of the things that Brassman and Gory's done. We've been on a, probably about a 10 year journey. So not, not quite as long as what you were expressing Doretta and, and probably intentionality since about oh, 2013 or so. So that would be seven years where we've done the things that you would expect. First of all, I can say our CEO, Jim Gory is very passionate about this topic. That matters, that counts. It's not for external reasons, it's not for client reasons. He just believes it just isn't right to, uh, for us to look like we look. And we, we, need to, we need to look more like society. And why don't we? And let's get better at it. And what are our biases? Why are we this way? So he's very passionate about it. We have um, a diversity inclusion executive steering committee that he sits on. Um, I sit on it and um, our diversity inclusion uh, director sits on it and a number of senior leaders sit on it and we've been at it for a long time and we've brought programs together and we do the things that you should be doing with measuring everything you can imagine measuring and um, a number of years ago we put an affinity group for our, our professional women together so because we have 12 offices and we're spread out all over the country with projects it's not unusual um, for one of our project engineers project managers to be a female on a project site when she's the only female of like her and she'll go all the, just her normal day if she's the only female. But when we bring that group together and we start doing it about five years ago, um, we started off with about 50 and we've got probably close to 180 in that group now to see them go, oh, there's a lot of people like me. That is really a kind of a cool thing to see. So we're doing that. But now I would say um, what you just said, Doretta, we know we're not doing enough. I mean, we've done stuff, but it isn't good enough. And, and we kind of had this belief five years ago that what we were doing, changing the dialogue around women at work and, and being a, a lot more um, work friendly towards females and recruiting females more. And certainly we've been recruiting people of color more too. And we thought we would, that one thing would spill a success in one area would spill over to another area and we're learning that it hasn't. And, and I read that's not unusual. It's okay. Well, that's not good enough. We've got to, we got to do better. Um, and so where we are now is this deep, I'll talk about it some more in a minute, but this deep seated, it's not good enough. Um, 
where we are isn't good enough. So what are we going to do with that? We've done a lot, but it's not enough. So we're, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, I'm pleased with where we've done. And like you said, Doretta, you know, don't beat yourself up for maybe things you hadn't done too much or with well as you should have in the past. But where we are today, it's not enough. So I'm, we'll explore that more in a minute. And the other thing I would just want to add, Tom, is that, you know, I caution people around, oh, well, this is what we need to do. We need to hire a whole bunch of women and people of color. Well, the first question I have for you is, is your environment, is your culture acceptive of what that is? And that was one of the things that I think that was really critical when we started looking at, as I've had the opportunity to look at or, other organizations. So is it acceptable? Is it going to be welcoming? Because although you, you, you hire me, if I'm not comfortable in the environment, what you're going to see is a negative response in terms of then your retention. Absolutely. So I, I think there's things that need to go hand in hand that we as leaders need to think about in terms of, are we creating that environment for people to come in and feel like they can still have a family, even though they may have to do billable hours? Can they still? So there's all these things that I think we as leaders need to consider as we start talking about, we want to expand, but we definitely need to make sure our environment is right and has the right culture for people to feel comfortable to do so. Jody, man, I, I just totally, I love that you said that because it is a culture issue. Um, we, I, in my safety journey a number of years ago, we were trying to tackle eye injuries. We had more eye injuries we should, that should be pretty easily. We had a company policy that you had to wear safety glasses in PPE around eye injuries and, and I'm going around trying to research what it hit and I'll never forget walking up on a project from a little bit of a distance. I'm walking down a little road and and I see these people looking at me like, who is that guy? Who is that coming? Oh, and then when I got close enough for them to figure out who it was, they pulled their safety glasses out of their pocket and put them on. They had them. They knew the policy. They didn't believe in wearing them. It wasn't a culture thing to wear them. So we knew we had to affect culture, not rules. Same thing here. We have to affect culture. That's a great example, Tom. Um, I know the sa safety piece is, and I, you know, being here at Breslin Corps, I, I agree safety is our number one priority. No one thinks about it. it you know, we just do it. Um, I think this topic is good, Jared. I don't know if this is jumping ahead um, to where you might think you have a slide that you were, that you have that you could talk about. It seems like this, this kind of discussion around diversity and inclusion, they're always lumped together, but um, you point out they're different. <laughs> <laughs> there's different things to think about. So do you mind sharing from um, your slide and, and kind of talk through the, these differences? Absolutely. So the one thing I think that we end up talking about and can hopefully you can see the slide. The one thing that I always want us to be able to level set is the difference between diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice. And it's funny because as this it, it, as diversity and inclusion has evolved, as we've dealt with many of the things that we dealt at the beginning of this year, and injustice has become, become one of them as well. We may have implied it, but it was never out there for us to discuss and speak to. And now we're in a position where people are now speaking around what is justice alongside diversity, inclusion, and equity. So what I'd love to share is just this, this amazing um, kind of talk track that um, Dafina Lazarus Stewart does. And so she says, Diver diversity asks who's in the room, but equity says who's trying to get in the room but can't. Whose presence in the room also is under constant th threat of erasure. And then inclusion asks, has, has everyone, have everyone's ideal been heard? And then justice responds, whose ideals won't be taken as seriously because they aren't the majority. And I want to stop right there because I don't want to read through the whole thing. But what is so, to me, impactful with this is that we as leaders start talking about how we want to put in diversity and inclusion programs or we want to do a diversity and inclusion um, council or we want to talk about em employee resource groups. Are we asking these questions? So if I do create that, does it still create a situation where people are having their ideas being heard? Is it creating an environment for people to feel safe, um, for belonging? And so we need to be much more expansive than just saying diversity, 
and inclusion. And that's why I love this quote. And then it takes me to this um, actual visual that I also love, the difference at looking at equality, equity, and justice. And so it is equality, everyone benefits from the same support. But the question is, even though you gave them the same support, does that actually speak to equity? So under equity, everyone gets the support that they need. And what I love about justice is that it gives you the opportunity to have everything be seen where you are. And so again, that question is one of those that we really need to consider and think about when we start talking about implementing either new programs, enhancing the programs we have, and then again, what are we trying to solve for? Can I add to that, Jody? I love that we you know we 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 talked about that yesterday. It's one of my favorite slides. In that in that justice slide, I'm, I wish I could see the audience because you may look. No one has to agree with me, and I'm certainly not an expert in this. And I'm just on a journey, and you can disagree with me or or, or think I don't even. I'm I'm so far away from truth. But I even I have heard white males say this. Why do we have to do all that? Why, do, why can't we just let the best person succeed? And why do, we, why do we have to go to extra? Why do we have to do all that? That just seems unfair. That seems, why do we have to do extra for somebody? Why can't, and, and I'm, I'm becoming aware, if you're in a system, no one ever complains about unfairness in their behalf. You know, like I got the improved seat on the airplane and you didn't, well, I don't ever go, I don't want it because that's unfair. I'm happy that I got the better seat. No one ever complains about unfairness in their favor. And if you're in a system where you kind of are getting the better deal all the time, the sooner something comes along that slightly not as good for you, it feels unfair, even though actually it's not. No one ever would say it's unfair to give somebody with poor vision eyeglasses. That's just empowering them to be able to see and learn. And what I think at least some of people like me have got to see that slide a little bit more like eyeglasses. It's not giving them anything extra, it's giving them what they need so that we're empowered to now contribute. And we have systems in place today that don't do that yet. And we've got to get the eyeglasses on people so that it's a level playing field so that everybody's empowered. That's great. <laughs> No, and I love that. And I love that. I absolutely love that. And I think when you start thinking of it, because that also talks about um, ADA and, and all these other right. things that come into play. Right. And we don't always consider that because easily I can say to you, oh, I can see the lens of being a female and being a black female. But now my lens is so much broader because it's just not that. And, and I love the fact that when you start talking about that, that it does changes people, hopefully perspective. But, but this is what I'll always say about diversity and inclusion. It is hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it is, it is one to one conversations. It is a continual conversation. It is a constant bringing people together and talking to them about it. Because I do, I do realize a lot of times in these conversations, it, um, it's, it can be very, emotional or it can be very um, passionate or it can be it can inflict things that you think about in terms of how you were raised or how you brought up or what your exposure was and when we start asking questions then I think it gets us to a better place and it's not that you're right Tom I'm wrong or vice versa it is a dialogue and I think we've got away from having dialogue having great just dialogue that doesn't necessarily mean we agree, but can we think of ways in which we can make things equitable for everyone? Can we think through that, you know? When I speak to a lot of my men leaders, I talk about the fact, do you have a daughter? Do you have a sister? I know you have a mother. <laughs> so you would want to be, you would want them to be in environments that are positive for them. And so when you start having those type of questions, it really changes when you can think at it from your, you know, your posture of things. But I love, I love that. So I'm just gonna tell you, Tom, I'm stealing that from you. <laughs> so that you know, I will be using that in other talks that I have. <laughs> I will 
too. That's awesome. <laughs> that was really great. Well, and I think that's a really great kind of lead into another question I wanted to, to send your way, Tom. You know, we, we're a construction company. A lot of the folks on this call are construction lawyers or work for construction companies. How, how are we handling or how are we having these conversations with our, our field employees or on job sites? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I wish I had a better answer um, for the group. I, all I can do is be honest. I don't think we're having good enough and enough conversations with construction employees in the field. It's a little bit challenging. I'm very proud of the conversations we're having in our offices where we have through technology, COVID has really made things difficult. Uh, we can have Zoom conversations and I'm very proud of these open dialogue conversations that our CEO Jim Gorey has initiated in the offices. And I'll just say, just we have small groups of say 15 to 20 on an ongoing basis that can share and talk, they're facilitated and people can express, there's been tears and hurt feelings and, and people that don't understand that are on there. And it's been a healing process we're not able, at least currently, able to replicate that quite on our construction site. So this is a group of construction people, and I know you know this, but on a typical construction site, we might have somewhere between 100 and 1,000 employees, workers, um, but maybe representing between 10 and, a hundred and 30 or 40 different companies spread out over a large space. And with our safety precautions around COVID, we have to have social distancing. We can't bring groups together. We can't, we used to, we used to be able to call all of that group together and have an all hands on meeting. So now what we're doing is we're giving messaging to our leadership groups who then give the messaging to the level down managing teams, leaders, foremen, and then relying on that to be allowing conversations down at the job site, but they're not facilitated and they're not orchestrated. It's a little bit like saying, you know, how are you having these conversations during a large college football game? It's just a lot of people doing a lot of things and it's not an environment that makes it easy to break off and have discussion groups. Corporate settings, that's a little bit easier for. So what we're trying to do is at least encourage our leadership who frankly, there's a lot of white males there um, to, to understand that this is a need that people have and to be open to people having hurt feelings and to be open to, Maybe hearing something you don't quite understand, and I'll wrap up by saying this, we also have zero tolerance for racially based social media posts. Zero tolerance. There has been some, there's been, I wish there hadn't been any, but there have been some, and those have resulted in suspensions for those employees um, that we, we just can't tolerate that. You know, it's a shame that probably were things going on before all this happened that other workers knew that somebody was posting this kind of stuff. We just didn't know it. But now when we know it, I'm proud of the fact that we have zero tolerance for it. That's great. Um, and I think that's the, going back to what we'll be probably kind of started is just being intentional is kind of the first step. I mean, we're, we're you know, being intentional and in, in moving forward. So I think that's, um, that's definitely putting us um, in, in the right direction. Um, you know, we, you, you've kind of mentioned like sort of things that are happening now. Obviously, to Doretta's point, diversity and inclusion, while it didn't have the momentum um, and support that it has recently, um, it's, it's been around for a while, but certainly in this year of 2020 and, you know, beyond COVID, but, it, you know, following the, the deaths of Ahmed Avery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, um, and then the social justice um, unrest that has, has kind of followed from that, I think, you know, organizations, families, people, the, the conversation has changed. Um, it seems for the good, um, hopefully for the good. So I'd be curious to hear, Doretta, how, how is your experience at the Braves or just, you know, other organizations you know of, how, how the conversations change since um, this, or since or during this time? Oh, oh you're on mute. Sorry, I think it's interesting that what's changed is we're having more, more conversations than we have before. I think the sports industry is so different than other industries. And as you see what's happened with not only MLB, but with NBA and with, with NFL, it, has, it really has taken on not just an organizational stance, but a community stance. 
And so MLB has always done an amazing job in what they've done around um, just inclusion and diversity within the, the, you know, the organization. And so I think what we did, and it goes back to what I said about having grace, we, were, we had a diversity and inclusion working group and we started doing that working group a year ago. And then at the beginning of January, before anything else started, before the injustice and all of those things that happened with the very tragic situations in our country, we had set up our, our diversity and inclusion um, council. But interestingly enough, we, we had to pivot and start thinking about what are the things that we need to engage our organization and our staff with, where they both feel comfortable to have difficult conversations and that they felt safe. And so that started happening and we, start, we set up a platform where people could come together and have these conversations and speak through that. And so I think the challenge is that we thought that maybe it would be one incident or two incident, but it isn't. So it has been a continuous factor that we've had to deal with on a, on a regular basis around what do we do to make sure that people can have their voices heard? And what are we doing to make sure that people feel safe in having those conversations? I think that's great. And Tom, I want to ask the same question to you in just a minute, but this, that's a really good segue to another question I'd wanted to pose to the group, which is um, how, how are we being mindful um, in, in, of giving our, our people of color and minority employees the space to kind of handle those conversations? Because I know, you know, I, I, I feel like there's been an awakening um, too late, <laughs> probably. Well, well, but, but there's been a lot more conversation going on than there had been. And I know that um, so there are people of color or minorities that feel like they can't answer all these questions. They can't answer on behalf that, you know, they're, they're tired, they're, they're feeling some fatigue, they're, they're feeling sad. And, and so, um, you know, just to, is there, is there something that organizations are doing or should be doing to encourage those conversations while still, you know, making space for minority people of color to kind of feel feel the feelings that they're feeling, you know, ha have the hurt feelings and, and the, the emotion. So either, either of you that like to, to jump in on that, feel, feel free. I'll, I'll jump in. So uh, I mentioned that, I thought won't, I won't take too long on it, but what we have um, from our CEO, Jim Gorey, have begun doing that. And what has been pretty interesting to me, um, and I'll, I'll speak in a minute, about the fact that this has been going on so long. What I think has changed um, in the conversations that I've had and others have had is the fact that we're having the conversations. I mean, these, these injustice, racial deaths are not new. That's what's outrageous. Um, they're not new. And people have been hurt by this for years. But the fact that we now can talk about it seems to be refreshing for people that I've talked to. And they don't seem to hold a grudge that we didn't talk about the ones a year ago and the ones a year before that. And what, At least we're talking about them now. Um, and then the other thing that I've had happen on occasion or two where someone that I spoke with much too late and expressed some disappointment that no one came to them to talk. And we're aware that other people were having conversations, but no one came to me to talk. And then that pain was real, that not only there was the pain of what they were going through, but then the pain that they weren't invited into a conversation was also real. We have a lot of work to do here. There's a lot um, that has gone on for a long, long time that people need to be able to talk about, and we're just starting. We're, and you said it, Doretta, it's a marathon. The whole DNI thing's a marathon, but this unpacking of what's been going on, we're just starting. Great, Doretta, anything to, to add on that point? No, I, I think Tom summarized it very well. 
Okay. Um, so Tom, I'll, I'll pivot back and, and ask you the question. Um, how has your organization's diversity and inclusion strategy changed? Um, sure. During well, this time? Well, well, first of all, I'm gonna say I've changed. Um, and I've touched on that. I, the, the, the fact that we have enough people who have had a racial based injustice death occur, that there's enough of them that's a little hard to remember them all. It's outrageous. And I don't mean outrageous like we normally use outrageous. I mean in outrage. And what's changed is video. Um, at least as a white male, you just can't dismiss these things anymore. Whatever the story spin might have been from the past, when you see it with your own eyes, you can't dismiss it anymore. And I, an analogy I like to use is the Boston Massacre. I'm a, I'm a, I love history. I've been there, I've been to the spot of it. You can take a walking tour to the Boston Massacre. You can, it's part of our history as a nation. It led, it spurred on the Revolutionary War. It was a terrible tragedy in our nation's history. How many people died in the Boston Massacre that's in all our history books? Five, five. This is comparable to that, um, it, but it's been going on for a while. So it's, it, there is this awareness that this is injustice at a deep level, at a societal level, and we got to get better. So what's happened in our company, and I know somebody put it up, in, it's intentionality. We've had DNI and initiatives for a long time, but this year we have four corporate initiatives, four, just four. One of them is DNI. Every business group, every corporate department, every operations group has to have DNI as their strategy. They're going to be held accountable for it. Um, from recruiting to inclusion to initiatives, what are you doing? We're going to be measuring promotions. We're going to be looking at opportunities because promotions come from opportunities. Opportunities, if they're not doled out fairly, we're not going to be able to have a qualified candidate to be promoted. We have intentionality at a level we've never had before. Stay tuned to see if it helps, um, but we're doing things at a level we've never done it before. That's great, and you know, I, I will comment since I, you know, I have the benefit of working here too. One thing that I've really enjoyed um, that, that Tom has mentioned, we've had a diversity, in, kind of similar to this this webinar, um, the brunch series, where we've had um, difficult conversations where we brought outside speakers, we've had internal speakers and people share. And it's been, it's been very authentic and very open. And again, I think this is, this is one of those moments where Zoom has helped us <laughs> because it's been able to be company-wide. Um, we've reached a really broad audience. And I think that that's one of the things that I've, I've really um, appreciated on, on, on the movement forward of, of you know, same thing, kind of what Jared was saying too, just we need to have the conversations and we need to be intentional. <laughs> Um, about the conversation. So, um, yeah, I think that's, um, that, that's very good. So, um, we have talked about a lot of different things. Um, there, you know, this is, um, it, it is, there's some, there's some parts of it that can be exciting. There's some parts that are very tragic. Um, but it, it, bottom line, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot, Tom said it well, to unpack. So I guess I would ask to both of you, um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Doretta. So after this great conversation, what is our call to action? Um, what action items should we take? We be taking within our organizations, you know, as, as being internal for all of us to those those folks on on the webinar who are um, lawyers and law firms. You know, what should they be taking to their clients? What what's the next step? So I think that. I think that's a great question. I think, and that's one of the things why I enjoy these conversations because it really is around what, what's the intent after we do this? What are we going to do and how do we want to have further impact? I think what's really important is that we begin to have conversations if we weren't having them before. I love using the primer um, from Fierce Conversations in terms of how do you start the dialogue and, and begin there. I think once you begin there, what are the other actual things that need to occur? Are you looking at how you're doing diverse slates? Are you considering um, employer resource groups that can help individuals, whatever it may be, whether it's around performance or it's around development or any of those pieces that are really critically important. But what are those things that you can make sure that you are being, again, and I don't want to overuse the word intentional, but what are the things that we need to start looking at? What do your policies look like within your organizations? 
Um, do you, you know, what, what does your hiring look like? And what are the decisions and how are you making those decisions? What are your promotions looking like, you know? And so it really is taking a look at, at, at that whole continuum of bringing someone into an organization, how you support them, and then um, and how they progress along what are we doing in those particular areas to make, to make sure that we're taking anything out of there that is not equitable? So I think it is really looking at your own organization and understanding, and does your organization have an appetite to do things around diversity and inclusion? And if it doesn't, what do you need to do to start having conversations with your leaders? There's this great, um, the, and I'm gonna say it wrong, so please apologize for me, before, I, I apologize, but it's called the 21 day challenge for racial for racial habits for and, and it's it's amazing what it does is it gives you this view of how you need to start thinking differently you can go look at certain books to read like it's this whole plan of 21 days where you do something different and it's specific on changing your habits around racial equality so those type of things, there are things that we can do individually and there's things that we have influence to be able to impact overall. I think those are really great. Tom, you, you got anything? Would you, I, I got, so would you repeat the question? This is our call to action. Oh, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, what, what are, what steps? I, should... Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna answer that this way. I, um, since many of you work with construction companies, and I would imagine many of you are in industries or where there, it is a white male dominated industry, um, we have to change our hiring patterns. We have to change our giving opportunities to people patterns. We have to change our promotion patterns. And we have to empower people from every walk of life. And I wanna ask you this question. How many of you in the room, I wish I could see a number of hands, have been asked in your career to help somebody out. It's a family member, it's a friend, and they've got a child, and hey, they just need a break, and can you help them find a place in your organization, or can you, um, it's, it's, can you just help them out? I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't ask, but I just need that. And you do it, you, that's what we all do. We help, we help. And if I were to see, Ray, ask this question, how many of those people you helped with a person of color? I'm sure there'd be some in the room that would raise their hands. But then if I ask this question, how many of those asking you for the favor with a person of color? It's that if we're, if we're mostly white and we mostly have white business associates and business friends, those people that are asking for these favors, there's nothing wrong with helping people. I'm all about helping people. It's just that we unfairly help people that are like us. And, and so I ask, look at these, look at the, look at the numbers, look at who's getting help. There's nothing wrong with somebody's helping their son-in-law get ahead. That's going to happen. But if we're only helping people that are like us, that's that unfair system. And so I ask, begin looking in your organizations at the systems of who we're, who we're helping, how we're helping. If it's only people like us, we're just keeping the same old, same old. I think that's great. I think we've all got some to do's to do <laughs> um, on, our, on our action item list. And um, I noticed um, Doretta wrote in the, the chats the, um, the 21 day racial equity habit building challenge. So I definitely would challenge all of us to take that challenge. Um, I think that would be um, that that's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we have one question, and in fairness to our panelists, we did not prep for this one, so, um, and we have very little time, too, so I will, I'll ask, ask it if you, if you have any thoughts on this particular order, and, and if not, it's okay, but we have a question about the, um, the recent executive order that was issued um, combating race and sex stereotyping, and so again, I know this was, you know, we, not something that we had prepared on, so we'll not not put you on the spot unless this is something that you have already looked into and researched and if you have any comment on it. I think we may have a good topic for, oh, sorry, Tom, do you? No, I was gonna say, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed before our audience that I don't have an answer for that. Um, I will, I need to look into it and understand it because I, I, I actually do not under, I don't have an answer for it. 
It was very recent. I'm sorry, Dreda, you were on. The only question that I have is how is this going to be implemented? Right. So as you look at, at, at what the order is stating, um, and it's requiring, like, like it, it was signed on September 22nd. I do know that. Um, so I'm just curious. They're talking, as you look at it, it talks about the OFCCP may investigate claims. I'm just curious. So I'm very familiar with EEOC and how that works. And I, you know, have dealt with it um, from an organizational standpoint and then friends that are on the other side of it. So my question is the impact and and how is it really going to be implemented? Yes. <laughs> and is, is it truly going to, <laughs> I mean, is it really going to be able to address what it state it's addressing? Right. The, the race and, st and sex stereotyping? Because at the end of the day, you can put an order in place, but it comes back down to behaviors. Right. Well, and I think maybe this, this is a great way to kind of, to, to wrap this up is, you know, yes, kind of implementation and how, how we can um, enforcement is certainly, you know, a question mark, but just the intentionality of having something out there and having us think about it is, is probably the, the, the step, the step in, in the right direction. And, and we'll, we'll have to look into those other, those other pieces as more unfolds. Um, but I think we may have a, a topic for another diversity brunch. So <laughs> <laughs> I think may have their topic. Um, I thank you both so much for your time, Dorota and Tom. This, this was fantastic. I really appreciate the, the, the candor and, and how authentic you both came and, and the, the information. So thank you both so much. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dorota, Tom, and Jody for an excellent discussion today. Uh, and, and thank all of you in the audience for joining us. Uh, so I want you to please mark your calendars for Thursday, November 19th, 2020 at 1 p.m. Eastern, when our guest speaker will be Jennifer Todd, founder and president of LMS General Contractors. Uh, Ms. Todd has been listed as one of ENR's groundbreaking women in construction. Uh, and our own Kathy Altman will discuss access and opportunity with Ms. Todd and how diversity is a solution for both leadership and labor shortages in the construction industry. So we will look forward to having you all join us next month. Feel free to invite as many as you can. And until then, stay safe and be well. Thank you. I think everyone popped, popped off it. Thank you, Tom. That was great. Okay, I'll come down and debrief. Yeah, all right. I don't know why. Somehow I'm the host, which was weird. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll see you. I was the host. Okay. Right. <laughs> Bye. Bye.